Hey guys, so today I'm going to talk about charge density waves. These are correlated states primarily found in one dimensional materials whose formation tends to push the electronic density distribution into a sort of wave like pattern, ultimately giving rise to an emergent behavior that turns out to have interesting ramifications on the material properties. To see how this can happen, let's consider a relatively simple one dimensional model in which there consists a whole lot of atoms spaced apart with some typical interatomic spacing, along with a set of valence electrons more or less localized around their parent atoms. Now if these atoms aren't too far apart, and if the valence electrons aren't too strongly bound to their parent atoms, this means that these electrons should be allowed to hop with some non-zero probability between neighboring atoms. This gives rise to a dynamical picture involving electrons hopping around in space, and if we wanted to solve for their equations of motion, ultimately we'd need to think about things quantum mechanically. So, this means that we can exploit the tools of second quantization, allowing us to obtain these quantum mechanical equations of motion simply by diagonalizing the appropriate Hamiltonian operator. In our case, this Hamiltonian would take a relatively simple form, and its band structure, which represents the set of allowed energy levels obtained from it, would end up looking something like a cosine wave in momentum space, having a minimum at the center and a saturation at the edges. Using this band structure, we can then proceed to visualize the ground state of our system, simply by filling it up with electrons. The lowest energy electron lying at the bottom, and the highest energy electron lying at an arbitrarily high point, that's called the Fermi level. Okay, but what does this have to do with charge density waves? Well, nothing yet since we've so far been ignoring the effects that interactions can have on the system. To see what I mean by this, remember that electrons are electrically charged particles, meaning that they should in principle interact with the electric field that's emitted by the underlying atomic nuclei. While we sorta kinda already took this into account by assuming that the electrons were localized around their parent atoms, we haven't yet considered any potential effects that thermal vibrations on the underlying atomic lattice often referred to as phonons, can have on the system. So let's do this. Probably the easiest way to do this would be to simply include an extra term in the Hamiltonian as a way of representing the energy associated with the interactions. This term would be what's called the electron-phonon coupling term, and if we wanted to get a more complete description of the system as a whole, we could include the bare phonon coupling term as well as a way of representing the energy associated with the interactions of phonons amongst themselves. Then, the dynamics of this new system can be assessed simply by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, in the same way as we did before. But, there's a problem here. As it turns out, the inclusion of these new interaction terms actually ends up making exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian, in general, not even possible meaning that we can't obtain an exact solution. Unfortunately, in this case, we're forced to seek an approximate solution, using an appropriate set of approximation methods. The good news, though, is that there turns out to be quite a few approximation methods that we can use. Probably the most famous is what's called perturbation theory, where one attempts to obtain an approximate solution by Taylor expanding the equations of motion to first order in the presumably small interaction term. While this is, in general, a very powerful tool, it turns out that in one dimension it doesn't actually end up working out so well. To see why not would be a little bit of an aside, but I do think it's worth briefly mentioning since the result is such an intuitive one. Basically, the problem is that in one dimension there's really not a lot of room for the electrons to move around in. It's really only either left or right, meaning that if only one electron is displaced in a certain direction, this electron will be forced to push all the other electrons in that same direction. This is a problem because in perturbation theory, the working assumption is usually that the system responds in a small, perturbative way to interactions, making it wholly incompatible with the unusually large response that we end up getting in one dimension. So, we need to think about things in a more exact, non-perturbative way by attempting to diagonalize the Hamiltonian as exactly as possible. This isn't the easiest thing to do, but there are a few ways to do it. One way might be to use what's called bosonization, 
where you'd write the fermionic electron operators in terms of bosonic fields and diagonalize there. Another might be to use what's called mean field theory, replacing certain terms in the Hamiltonian with their mean field eigenvalues, obtaining an approximate averaged Hamiltonian. In either case, performing a detailed analysis using one of these methods will show that the effect of electron phonon interactions in one dimension is to induce a new, lower energy ground state, opening a gap at the Fermi level and pushing the energy of electrons down. In the case of an effectively attractive electron phonon interaction, this would result in superconductivity, but if it's an effectively repulsive one, the result would be a spontaneous reorganization of the electrons into a periodic modulation that's called a charge density wave. Pretty cool. But how can we test this? After all, the discussion has so far been limited to one-dimensional materials, which play no role in our three-dimensional reality, right? Well, not quite. As it turns out, there are quite a few quasi-one-dimensional materials that can form three-dimensional structures by linking together chains of one-dimensional patterns. This is the case in, for example, niobium triselenide, whose three-dimensional structure is formed by linking together one-dimensional chains of niobium-selenium bonds. This material has been studied before, and charge density wave ordering in it has been confirmed in a number of ways. Here's two. The first comes from what's called scanning tunneling microscopy. The idea here is that the quantum mechanical tunneling probability of electrons across a potential energy barrier is directly related to the number of states on the other side. So, if you bring an electrically charged tip close enough to the surface of a material, this means that the tunneling probability, and therefore the measured current from the tip, should get larger as you approach an atom, being that atoms have a large number of available quantum energy states. This provides a fairly straightforward means of directly probing the positions of atoms on a lattice, and in the presence of charge density wave ordering, the positions of these atoms should be expected to shift in accordance with the periodicity of the charge density wave. And what do you know? This is exactly what was observed in the quasi-one-dimensional material niobium triselenide. So that's already one hint at the existence of charge density wave ordering in quasi-one-dimensional materials. The other is a bit more subtle. It makes use of the general fact that waves tend to get pinned to large obstructions. Sort of like how the wave on a string pins to zero amplitude near the edges. In the context of material science, these large obstructions can take the form of lattice impurities, often appearing as, for example, unwanted atoms from the atmosphere, or maybe just dirt in the material. In the presence of these impurities, charge density waves can get pinned, inhibiting their ability to move around much and giving rise to electrically insulating behavior. However, this pinning can be overcome by applying a large enough in-plane electric field in order to rip the charge density wave off the impurity sites. If this is true, then this can show up as a nonlinearity in the current versus electric field characteristics, since they should define a critical electric field over which the current suddenly begins to rise. And this is again exactly what was observed in niobium triselenide. So this is pretty decent evidence to believe in the existence of charge density wave ordering in quasi-one-dimensional materials. This in turn should raise some awareness to the important role that interactions can play in determining the behavior of physical systems. Being just one example, it'd be interesting to think beyond charge density waves and ask what other types of emergent correlated states you can get from interactions. And indeed, how many common everyday materials might be dominated by this elusive emergent behavior. Thanks so much for watching guys. I hope you found this as cool as I did. Let me know what you think and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao!